Okay, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, yeah, so you know, keep this very informal. I'll I'll show you some of the stuff that uh, my group does here at UT, and sort of give you a sort of basic introduction to the more sort of hardware of superconducting qubits. Uh, so this is uh, just a one slide telling you a little bit about my group. So we we build superconducting quantum circuits. The types of circuits we build are sort of shown over there. That uh, and, uh, scanning electron micrograph of a uh, uh, Josephson junction, which is what goes into a transmon qubit, which I think many of you have heard of. Uh, so in, in my group, we take these uh, Josephson junction transmon qubits, we put them into aluminum boxes that are sort of macroscopic in size. You can really literally hold it in your hand, and uh, and we use that for doing things like read out of qubits, read out of the state of the qubits, or storing information in, inside the oscillator. Uh, so the group is still young. I moved here on, only in 2019. I was previously at Yale uh, in the so big superconducting qubit group there. Uh, so we have one postdoc, a couple of graduate students, and we also have two undergraduate students who are both sort of electrical engineering physics uh, type background, uh, both I think in their third or fourth year. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the in the sort of the if the slides would advance, that would be nice. Okay, no, I'm now I'm just trying to move your oh, your like, computer is not responding. It's not responding to the slides. Uh huh. Oh. <laughs> Any tabs open? Oh, one tab open. This is not the screen. Okay, that worked. Okay, it just took a while. Okay, so um, I guess I just wanted to, before going into the details of today's presentation, give you some pictures of other types of superconducting circuits we build. Uh, so everyone kind of coming from outside of this you know field hears about the transmon as the the qubit but there are actually lots of other circuits that also go into making this quantum computer work uh, so we build a whole bunch of other types of signal processing circuits so you know, from an electrical engineering point of view that's very interesting so these are uh, what is called a josephson ring modulator uh, it's a it's a device with something like eight Josephson junctions in it. Uh, this is a microwave amplifier called an array mode parametric amplifier. Each of these loops that you see has four Josephson junctions in there, and and this device, which is this Neander thing, uh, has something like a thousand of those loops. Right, so that's we're talking about five thousand Josephson junctions there. Uh, and then this bottom thing on the uh, here is another example of a, uh, a circuit that we built for microwave amplification. The cool thing about all of these uh, circuits is that they are essentially microwave amplifiers. Uh, they are also quantum in nature. So they are actually things that do continuous variable quantum computing. Uh, and the, the, the nice, really, sort of from the physics point of view, the you know, very interesting part, you know, interesting concept behind these amplifiers is that they always add noise, but they add noise that is sort of fundamentally given by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So really laws of physics, not something technical. Uh, so, so we build these kinds of devices here in our lab to uh, in our clean room up on the Pickle campus. Uh, and then this last uh, example here is, is a more semiconductor type uh, device. It's a, it's a device which has both semiconductors, P5 semiconductors like indium arsenide, along with superconductors like aluminum. And it's basically a gated Josephson junction. So it looks, if you have ever seen a, a, a standard CMOS transistor, a silicon transistor, that's a three terminal device with a gate, a source, and drain. 
this is a Josephson injunction, but it has a gate electrode that allows you to tune the Josephson uh, inductance, basically. Yeah. Um, so first of all, the three things at the top are not worked done at UT, but they have error that's uh, like not set by the Heisenberg uncertainty principles. So there's more error than the work you guys do. Is that correct? No, no. So all of these are stuff that. I mean, okay, the exact images are all coming out of my Yale work, but are things that I can build here as well. So we do build, especially this device in the bottom left here. Uh, they're all examples of different microwave signal processing devices, which have different you know, utility for our quantum computers. So I'm going to tell you today about how you, uh, when you want to read out the state of your transmon qubit, you actually need to do a lot of work. And these are the devices that are used for doing all of that extra signal processing. I'm going to tell you in, in just one or two slides. Yeah. And you can probably answer this after with one or two slides, but I've seen these chains of Josephson injunctions before, and I've never quite understood like what is the purpose of putting so many in a line? What exactly does it do? Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, Essentially, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, but the Josephson junction is a nonlinear inductor. And when you combine many of them in series, you sort of are able to really set how much nonlinearity you want versus some other parameter uh, that goes into you know, designing this device. So in a few slides from now, I'll tell you a little bit about how you, you know, how you design a microwave amplifier, for instance, and, and that will involve Styling many of these, arraying many of these together. Okay, so so okay, so for today, in the next you know, 30, 40 minutes, uh, I thought you know since most of you are coming from a more software perhaps background, uh, I'll give you an introduction to the underlying hardware that you may not see so much, even when you you know uh, see the QuizKit lectures, for instance. So I'll talk about what is the Josephson junction, what's the transmon qubit. Uh, I guess Nick Braun at, uh, at IBM in his talk, he must have told you a lot about gates, which is usually what people talk about. Uh, uh, the other kind of very important thing we need to all be able to do for these computers to become useful is actually read out the state, right? So you want to do gates, but you also need to be able to measure it, measure the qubit and it's not obvious that you can do that well. It takes a bunch of work. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, and in particular, at the end, I'll tell you about how in our group, we build these ultra low noise amplifiers that, that help us read out the state of qubits fast and accurately. And I guess I should just advertise this course. I know for this audience, it may not be the most appropriate, but there is a graduate level course in automatic information hardware that I offer every other spring. And I do welcome undergraduate students if you've done any quantum physics course. So uh, at the undergraduate level. So Scott Aronson's course or the ECE courses in quantum physics or, or, or in physics department. Uh, so you'll see in a little bit why you may need at least some quantum background to do this course, uh, okay? Okay, so, so that's what a Josephson junction is. So it's a, this is a cartoon. It's two pieces of superconductor, typically aluminum, separated by a thin oxide barrier about a nanometer of thickness. And so that's the, that's a cartoon. And this is how it looks physically. So you have two leads coming in from bottom right and bottom left and top right. And then right in the middle, these two leads sort of overlap and that overlapping region where is where uh, there is a tunnel junction. Okay, so that's two layers of aluminum. You can't see the oxide; it's, it's a nanometer thick, and uh, between those two leads, you can see some extra stuff here and here. Just don't worry about that. That's just sort of a detail of how we fabricate these devices. Okay, uh, so <coughs> what the device basically looks like is that you have current flowing through it, and the current is sinusoidally related to the phase phi or flux phi. And the flux phi is an in time integral of the voltage across the device. And so for every you know, electrical device, we like to talk about the IV relationship. So a resistor is V equal to IR. 
This is a i is equal to i naught sine phi, where phi is integral of u. So it's a much more complicated device than uh, than a simple resistor. But actually, uh, if you sort of think a little bit about it, uh, what it actually looks like is a nonlinear induction. So first of all, there is this symbol that we give for it, a cross and a box. It stands for a cross, which is what we call the Josephson inductance. And this capacitance Tj, which is arising because you have basically two metals separated by a gap. So that's a capacitor. So there's a capacitor, and then there is this what's called a Josephson tunneling inductance. Uh, and uh, where it essentially comes from is that if you if you tailor expand the sine phi, you get phi as the first term in the Taylor expansion, and, and, and an element which has i proportional to phi is basically an inductor, right? So if you just learn from your undergraduate electromagnetism course, an inductor has phi equal to Li. So phi is proportional to i. That's the same thing here. So the first term of this Taylor expansion behaves like an inductor, and then there are higher terms, which makes it a, what's called a nonlinear inductor. Uh, so, this, this element basically has an inductance that depends on the current flowing through it. Okay. And that, that's what that's the basic underlying element that we love. Uh, it's a nonlinear inductor. And because everything has superconductors here, there's very little dissipation. There are no resistors in this circuit. Okay. Uh, so what we do is we take that. Uh, this injunction, we put a C across it, a capacitor, and that basically makes an LC oscillator. So that's what this injunction and capacitor makes the transmon, which is an LC oscillator, but it's an harmonic because of the nonlinearity of the L. So uh, in any LC oscillator, we can draw the potential energy of the oscillator. And when we now treat this uh, with quantum physics, we get discrete energy levels, just like in a hydrogen atom, you have discrete energy levels. When you have in the hydrogen atom case, it's a Coulomb potential. Here it's more like a sinusoidal potential, but you have these discrete energy levels. And so what we do when we say we are going to use our transmon as a qubit, we are saying that we're going to store information in the lowest two energy levels, G and E. But the transmon actually is an unharmonic oscillator, so there are higher energy levels, F, H, etc., that we sort of usually ignore. Okay, and it turns out that the frequency. So we adjust all the parameters such that the frequency difference between the lowest two energy levels is about five gigahertz, which is a convenient what's called microwave frequency scale, where we have a lot of electronics that allows us to sort of drive that transition do gates on that transition. So Nick, uh, Nick Braun must have told you a little bit about single qubit gates, which would involve driving this circuit with a microwave drive at that frequency. And two qubit gates, like a cross resonance gate, would involve taking two of these transmons, putting them together, and then driving one at the other frequency, something like that. That's what the, that was, how it works. OK, so that's our, uh, that's our Two level system. And uh, so nothing is perfect. There is an error associated with storing information in this qubit. The typical time scale at which errors occur is, is roughly 10 to 100 microseconds. Though now there are examples of other qubits where even this number is in the millisecond range. Yeah. Is T5 different than T2? Yeah. So we typically write a dephasing time T5. And T2 is basically given as 1 over T2 is 1 over 2T1 plus 1 over T5. Sure. So you can you can do it either way, but if you give T1 and T5, you can also calculate T2. So, okay. so it's it's all they're all very closely related quantities. Yeah. And Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. So, like on the left side, the nonlinear um, conductor, like, does that kind of modulate the amount of current flowing through in that portion of the circuit? So, sure. 
So what's happening here is that there's an L and a C, and now current and voltage in an LC circuit basically oscillate with time. And the frequency of the oscillation is, is basically that five gigahertz, okay, that number five gigahertz. So uh, the what you call qubit, you, when you ask what is zero and what is one refer to, in like a spin qubit, we can say zero refers to spin pointing along the field, magnetic field, and one refers to spin pointing opposite to the magnetic field. Here, uh, one way to understand this is zero plus one or G plus E, the, the so-called X state, corresponds to current oscillating between these two, you know, so, uh, capacitor and inductor with a certain time uh, variation. And G minus E, which is the other X superposition, refers to that oscillation happening about half a period later, or so a quarter of a period later. So it's a little bit more complicated to say what is your qubit? Like what exactly does zero mean and what exactly does one mean? But, but another way to think about it, if you've learned about harmonic oscillators, then you can call G as basically the oscillator is in its ground state, that it's not oscillating. And one corresponds to having one photon in that oscillator. Yeah. What is an inductor and what is a capacitor? Uh, so an inductor is essentially an element where the current through the element is related to the flux linearly. Uh, I is equal to uh, uh, phi is equal to li, whereas a capacitor is an element where the charge on the capacitor is related to the voltage by this linear dependence q equal to cd. Right? So I know you're, you're in your first first semester, but in your next semester in edge course and use course, you're going to learn about inductors and capacitors. We don't we don't teach inductors and capacitors in the first course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that answer your question roughly? Yeah, and is the I think correctly is the B like the unitary gate you would apply to like also the two of the frequency and so the yeah so this is just coming from my all of my sort of more physics -y type uh, this, this is the Hamiltonian that's, like that's yeah. the Hamiltonian B is called the annihilation operator which for oscillators is how you describe uh, the, the raising and lowering. In, in qubit land, we use, use sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, poly operators. You can think of B as basically being a matrix. It's unfortunately an infinite dimensional matrix, so that's not easy to draw. But let's say you have zeros on the diagonal and you have one, root two, root three, et cetera, on the just lower diagonal. And then B dagger is the complex conjugate of that. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and you cannot, un unlike a standard poly matrix, it, it, uh, it's like one, two, three. So unlike a standard um, poly matrix, which is just finite dimensional, uh, this is infinite dimensional, but you can sort of understand that if you look at just the first two by two, you see something that looks like what in, in qubit land looks like sigma minus. Mm -hmm. Right, so sigma x, which we call as 0, 1, 1, 0, looks a lot like b plus b dagger when you truncate b plus b dagger to only the first two by two. Is that b dagger or b? Uh, well, okay, I never remember which is b and which is b dagger, but, but let's, let's just say this is b and the other one is b dagger, okay? Okay. Okay. So, so that's uh, so. Now, what we do is we take that transmon. Uh, it's defined on a sapphire chip. There's a Josephson junction in there. There are two big pads that are the capacitors. So that's a photograph of a transmon that you can take in an optical microscope, uh, and it's really macroscopic. You can actually see it, unlike any other qubit implementation, which is microscopic. 
uh, and then you put it in this sort of aluminum box, which acts like a harmonic oscillator. Uh, so there's a Hamiltonian, but we don't have to worry about it. Basically, we drive this circuit with some microwave uh, signals, and we look at the output coming out of those signals uh, out of that circuit. Uh, so what I guess I want to tell you about is how do we actually read out this qubit? Uh, so, so now I'm showing you sort of a circuit diagram representation of this you know, physical object. It's a, you have the qubit, which has your Josephson junction and capacitor. You have a bunch of other capacitors and you have another inductor. So this bottom LC refers to that aluminum box. The top thing in green, in green refers to this transmont qubit. And then there are a whole bunch of other capacitors that just say that these circuits are coupled together. Uh, and so now what happens is that if you drive your resonator, with some signal and you look at the output signal what you expect to get is that this resonator has a particular frequency at which it likes to respond it likes to oscillate at only one frequency which is basically one over square root lc uh, and so so there is a, a, a certain frequency where it likes to respond but that frequency at which it likes to respond depends on the qubit state you can think a little bit if you have done an EMM course. Basically, if you stick a little bit of dielectric inside a capacitor, you change the value of the capacitance. So the qubit is basically acting like a dielectric, but the dielectric constant depends on the state. So, so what in effect what you're doing is okay, you have this LC oscillator over here. That's your microwave resonator, and then depending on the qubit state. You stick in or don't stick in some dielectric into the C. And effectively, you change the frequency of the oscillator. Yeah. Uh, when I saw this at IBM, it didn't seem like they had the second microwave resonator. It just was an incoming uh, microwave pulse with a capacitor in between that and the qubit. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, is that a valid, but it must be valid I, unless I'm misunderstanding what IBM does. So what IBM might have showed you is how they do gates. So if you just want to do a gate, you apply like the green stuff, which just goes through a capacitor and, and hits the qubit, makes it makes currents and voltages oscillate inside it. And, and therefore it, it you can do your sigma X or sigma Y gate. This is, Specific to the case of reading out, which you have to always do. So yeah. if they didn't tell you about that, they just sort of glossed over it. It it exists. Oh, oh, I think they did tell us about this. They had a capacitor on the outside of the qubit. The qubit was inside a capacitor, the whole thing. Yes. And is that what's going on there? Right. So in in the sort of IBM style qubit, you have a junction, you have a capacitor, which makes the transform, and then you have another capacitor. Which is this stuff, this small thing oh, that I have shown you, to a what is called a readout resonator. In IBM's yeah. case, it would have been some kind of on chip coplane like line with a meander. Yeah. That would be what it would look like. So, this sort of 3D box behaves very similarly to the meandered line that you saw in IBM's okay. setup. It's, they are you know, basically identical as far as yeah, the, the resonance is cavity. The resonance. Okay, so uh, so okay, so so that's the underlying physics, and so what we can do is if we want to read out the state of the qubit, we we figure out the state of the oscillator, this microwave resonator. We figure out its frequency, and then by knowing its frequency, you name the state of the qubit. So what that boils down to is you apply a drive sort of at this middle point between these two response functions. And there's a difference in the phase of the signal that comes. So there's a readout pulse that you apply to this. And then that pulse goes out. And basically, you get two possible responses. So what, what's shown here in I and Q are two possible uh, signal values. That are, you know, that's the G value, and that's the E value, or 
So vice versa. Blue is G, red, red is E. There is sort of actually a distribution because there's always noise. So you don't actually always get only one number, one complex number, but rather a, a distribution, a Gaussian distribution centered on some mean value. Uh, and so then, so yeah, so it's interesting. So we, when we think about reading out a qubit, we expect to get two answers, zero and one. But actually, these are microwave signals, they're continuous electrical signals. You get a continuous number. And the way that we say, okay, it's G or E is that these distributions are well enough, far enough apart that you can draw a line in the center and say that if I get a signal on the left of the line, I'm in G. If I get a signal on the right of the line, I'm in E. Okay? So it's, it's a continuous electrical signal you measure, and then you discretize it by, by, uh, by finding that they are well separated by some separatrix line. Okay. So how well can we actually discriminate between these two states? It really depends on how broad these distributions are, how much noise is there in your circuit, in your measurement. And so uh, this idea that there's an amplifier that you need to use to take this very weak electrical signal and really magnify it without adding a lot of noise. That's sort of a crucial part of being able to read out these states efficiently and properly. Okay, yeah. How do you control the fact that the signal comes out on the right rather than some of it bouncing back at where the drive pulse came? Yeah, so the, the detail in that is the fact that these capacitors that you see uh, are actually, you know, the reason one is bigger than the other is that it's asymmetric. One capacitor is much smaller than the other. And that makes that most of the signal that uh, goes out towards the right actually carries information about the qubit. And you have a very large drive signal to get past the small capacitor. Yes, you apply a large drive, enough, large enough drive signal that you can actually enter through that small capacitor. I think the last slide, there was another term in the Hamiltonian which is purple. Okay, um, sure, I can explain that. So that term in the Hamiltonian is uh, this, this yeah. term, that's what called the dispersive shift. Uh, and that is the term that essentially makes this behavior that the qubit acts like a dielectric of radius mm -hmm. constant. Uh, Basically, B dagger B is like sigma Z. So when I flipped, I, I wrote it as chi sigma Z A dagger A. And so now when you stare at this Hamiltonian, you see omega C plus chi sigma Z. So that is a frequency. So the, the frequency of the A oscillator is given by this stuff in the parenthesis. But you see that that has two values because sigma Z has two values, plus one and minus one. So the frequency of the oscillator shifts by chi, plus chi and minus chi. And sorry, the A is for the qubit. This A is the oscillator. A is the annihilation operator of the oscillator. Uh, and B is the annihilation operator of the qubit. Oh, I get it. Okay. 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 Yeah, so that, that's, you know, that gets into real quantum physics over there. So I, I, I could have just not shown <laughs> This is the interesting physical understanding that. that is. Okay. Uh, okay. So I basically said that being able to read out a qubit well depends on how much noise you add. So a little bit about an amplifier. So you know, an electrical engineer is really one of the things that we learn very soon early in our undergraduate careers are is how to understand amplifiers and how to build them. What's an amplifier? Basically, it's a thing that takes a signal and makes a larger copy of it, right? But so it provides power gain, but it also takes the noise that comes in and, and also makes a larger copy of that noise. Uh, but the sort of sad thing about an amplifier is that it always adds noise, extra noise, right? And so you may think, why do you ever want to use an amplifier? The answer is that. You know, there's always some detector at the end of this after the amplifier. There's something, a voltmeter, something that you're going to use to measure, and that has noise. And so the purpose of this amplifier is that it overwhelms the detector noise. That, that's why you have an amplifier. And so the real question is, 
you know, we want to use, we need, need an amplifier to overwhelm detector noise, but at the same time, we want to minimize the added noise. We don't want to have extra noise. Uh, so there is a sort of a theorem from uh, a person called Carlton Caves, who basically showed that an amplifier adds a minimum of half photon of noise. Uh, let's not worry about the details of this slide, but basically, this is a manifestation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you, you learn about how you cannot measure position and momentum of an oscillator arbitrarily well, right? You cannot, you know, delta x, delta p has to be greater than h bar over 2. That's the same thing as saying, you know, it, it boils down to the same thing as saying that when you have a signal that has two possible phases, you cannot measure those two arbitrarily well. Uh, there has to be some extra noise added. And the fact that the h bar over 2 that is there in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically shows up as some extra noise in this, in this signal. So uh, if you look at basically this noise law, so you have a signal that the, the vector has a noise circle associated with it. When you have the amplifier, it increases the length of this vector. It blows up the circle because you're increasing the noise. But you're basically adding some extra noise so the, the actual circle is a little bit bigger than just the gain times the initial circle and with a with with the best amplifier you can ever build this extra circle will be the smallest it can ever be right so that that's basically what heisenberg uncertainty principle tells you and so and so what it boils down to is that okay the amplifier we choose Will basically set the size of these distributions. Uh, and if we have a worse amplifier, the distributions will be larger. And so you'll have poorer fidelity for your. Input. Yes. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much your amplifier is amplifying, you still will only get half a boson of change. Yes. So whenever we do this, that's why it's called referring back to the input. So we always describe the noise of an amplifier as okay, there's a gain. So on the output, yes, indeed, you get much more signal and noise. You just refer it back to the input by dividing by the gain. And now you say, OK, is the noise the same as the input signal? But no, it's not. It's actually a little bit bigger. Oh, OK. okay. So, so it still is more noise when you're doing more amplification. Yes. But yes. OK. Uh, so, so, you know, so basically, the fact that your amplifier is not perfect means that these distributions are a little bit broader than they should be. That they could ideally be, and that means that the fidelity of this readout is worse. And it may seem a minor thing, but you know, in a in in our in our quantum computer, we want to be able to read out the state of our qubit with many nines of fidelity, nine nine point nine 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 nine, right? So basically, there's an exponential function that links the imperfection of the amplifier with the fidelity of our readout. So a small improvement in the, in the amplifier can give you exponential improvements in the fidelity of your readout. Uh, so the innovation that happened at Yale and in many other places with superconducting qubits roughly about, let's say, 10 to 15 years ago, which really put this technology even on the map for a quantum computer as compared to, let's say, a trapped ion qubit system, was the fact that we could actually read out our qubits with amplifiers, which were extremely efficient. So a standard semiconductor amplifier was called a HEMP. It's a transistor amplifier, adds noise of roughly 20 photons. And how the amplifiers we make with Josephson junction which were the photographs I showed at the beginning of the talk, add only one photon of noise. So that's a factor of 20 better amplifiers. And that's sort of what is the reason for us being able to measure our qubits with very high fidelity in a very fast time, very 100 nanosecond time. Okay. 
Yep. Sorry, going back to the half photon thing. Yep. So even if you amplify by like an epsilon amount, you'll still get that half photon. That seems. Ah, so okay, so that uh, that I don't know if it's there explicitly. So this is this half photon is what's called the minimum noise, but for large gain, and you always need large enough gain to beat the detector. So typically, we operate with a gain of a hundred, which is large enough that effectively we are adding at the minimum half photon of noise. How does it scale at a small? Oh, at a small, it'll be linear. So. Okay. But but you know uh, using a gain of let's say one point two right. it's not why are you doing yeah. it right so you're not adding noise in that case but it's not useful okay so let's see uh, I have maybe how much more time do I have three forty five okay I can just spend another five to ten minutes uh, I'll just say a little bit about you know I said amplifiers maybe I should tell you a little bit about What's underlying? How do these amplifiers work? Essentially, you know how well this kind of amplifier works. It's this child on a swing example. So you know if you're swinging, you can move your body in sort of an oscillatory fashion to amplify the swing. So that's what's called a parametric amplifier. Your this oscillator has a parameter. In this case, the moment of inertia, and you you change the moment of inertia. You change the parameter in a periodic fashion and then your oscillator sort of amplifies the oscillation right so if you change the moment of inertia in a periodic fashion it turns out to be twice the frequency of the oscillator and then the oscillation at omega naught just sort of becomes larger and larger uh, so you need some energy to do that so in the case of the oscillator you need you're basically moving your body against the centrifugal force and that's sort of you have to do work right so that's how you get also you get amplification and you cannot do this with a linear resonator you have to have a non-linear resonator so in this case you know that the, the the gravitational field goes as sine theta not just theta so it's a non-linear oscillator and our Josephson junctions are non-linear oscillators so that's why we can basically build the same also uh, so this is an example, a closer example of our snail parametric amplifier that uses that principle. Uh, you can see basically a device that's made on with on a silicon chip with aluminum and these Josephson junctions that are shown here. Here is that loop of four Josephson junctions. There are three on the top and one on the bottom, and then an array of many of them. And in this case. Basically, with, these are all tuning knobs. You can, you can. It's basically a circuit design problem. You want the best amplifier, which is highest gain, lowest noise, highest bandwidth, highest ability to process as big a signal as you want to send it to it. Uh, and of course, as an engineer, you're not going to get everything. So there are a bunch of parameters that you can play with in your in your circuit design to optimize for one over the other, and maybe try to make all of them as good as at least the application demands, right? So that's the that's one of the games we play as circuit designers that we, we have these devices like junctions. We have a bunch of other sort of EM structures like L's and P's, and we can sort of play with all of them together to, to try to make the best amplifier. So that's something we do in our lab. Uh, and then, Okay, so I'll just leave you with this. Um, so this was some very early work which I was involved in uh, back at Yale. So this experiment, what you're seeing over here is the readout signal when you measure a superconducting qubit with one of these uh, parametric amplifiers, Josephson parametric amplifiers. So every single point on this trace is basically, I read out my qubit uh, in about, 200 nanoseconds and I'm basically just watching my qubit and it's, it's, it's staying in the excited state and then it jumps down to the ground state because there's some error and so it jumps to the ground state stays in the ground state and then some error again it jumped up to the excited state so so what you're seeing these are what's called quantum jumps uh, basically the fact that this readout signal is, is there is noise 
But whenever you jump, the jump, this, the, the change in the signal is larger than the noise. And so you can very clearly associate one signal with the excited state and the other signal with the ground state. Right? And the fact that our amplifiers add very little noise is what is responsible for this noise level to be small enough compared to the change in the signal when you're going between two states. And so, uh, so there's a there's a nice thing that all of these this noise itself is fundamental what's called quantum noise. But maybe the more important point for us is that this work uh, was sort of back in the day really showed how you can read out the state of qubits with very high accuracy. And you know, over the last ten-ish years now, uh, this this thing, you know, this readout fidelity has also progressively improved. Uh, this was like one qubit. Now in the IBM machine, they probably use a parametric amplifier to measure something like 10 qubits. And so if you have a 100 qubit machine at this point, probably they have 10 parametric amplifiers in their computer. And you know, one of the questions is, well, maybe you don't want to scale like that. Can you really build an amplifier that can measure all the qubits you have, for instance? So those are the sort of maybe frontiers of the field. Okay. I think I will stop over here given the time. And yeah, I'm happy to take further questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was planning, I, I think like uh, a lot of our club members, so first of all, well, two of our interested in for pursuing hardware as part of the research group are here today because 